Diablo started out like this. And now it's that. The first Diablo completely changed the RPG genre back in the day, but 26 years and KFC sandwiches later, we have ourselves Diablo 4. After getting a chance to play some of that, I immediately went back in time to go through Diablo 1, Diablo 2, and Diablo 3 to see where the series has evolved and how all four of them stack up to each other. I'm Alex, and this is a reconsidering of the Diablo quadrilogy. And hey, if you happen to be new here, hit subscribe. First up, in early 1997, some claim the last day of 96, out from a pixelated hell plop Diablo 1 and the Hellfire expansion soon after. In this specific year of the 1900s, the Titanic is about to release in theaters, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is on your TV, and your beige personal computer has a poorly placed sticker on it. RPGs around this time were either very slow and kind of clunky or were turn-based, but when Diablo hit, no other RPGs were anywhere near this fast-paced. What we think of today as an ARPG is born. In Diablo 1 plus the Hellfire expansion, the classes were Warrior, Sorcerer, Rogue, Monk, Barb, and Barbarian. Those last two you had to do some odd file manipulation to actually unlock them. Things were kind of weird back then. What I found to be most impressive when I jumped back into one is that many of the core fundamentals of Diablo were fully figured out way back on this first attempt, and they're still used today. A semi-transparent overview map and menu systems that can be used during gameplay without pausing. Town portals to dip back to the hub area whenever you want. The mysteries of unidentified gear. Those awkwardly combustible barrels we endlessly must smack holding shift to attack or cast in place. And of course, Deckard Kane doing the Deckard Kane thing. Stay a while and listen. Now, one of the not so great things about Diablo 1 and what makes it kind of hard to go back to is the loot. Things that are dropped can be easily missed since they blend in so much with the ground, and you can only highlight things with use of a temporary buff from a search spell or a scroll. I looked in the key bindings and nope, there is no way to easily reveal that loot that's on the ground, so don't miss it with your eyeballs. But for some reason, there's two keys dedicated just to dynamically raising and lowering the brightness during gameplay? Why would you ever need main center keys used up just to do that? The other thing that was kinda hard to get used to is how death works. When you die playing solo in Diablo 1, you don't drop your stuff, lose durability, or get kicked back to town. No, you flat out suck at life, progress lost, go back to the last time you manually saved, which you better hope wasn't too long ago. Other things I just plain didn't remember about Diablo 1, like these potions which can instantly increase your weapon's total damage value. Huh. There's no skill trees here, so new spells are learned just by finding or buying books. Knowledge is pow- oh, they beat me to it. Gold is a hugely important resource in Diablo 1, and I was always trying to save up for some better gear, but ended up always blowing it all on restocking my potions instead. That, along with the more traditional level-to-level -level design and high difficulty spikes, makes Diablo 1 play more like a survival dungeon crawler. I kinda like that about it. Man, it sure is hard to see in this place. Oh. So, in conclusion, Diablo 1 brought more real-time action to RPGs, and that brutal survival-like feel of its progression is one thing that I wish was more present in the later entries. Which takes us to the year 2000 when Diablo 2 hit, and the Lords of Destruction expansion a year after. Almost everything is doubly, maybe triply improved or expanded on over Diablo 1, and this was made in just three years after that came out. In Diablo 2 plus the Lords of Destruction expansion, we had the classes Amazon, Assassin, Barbarian, Druid, Necromancer, Paladin, and Sorceress. The sequel expands out of the confines of just dark, basic-looking dungeons, with large, above-ground areas which could lead you into various underground caves and dungeon systems. 
Other things D2 added, let's just bang them out. An AI companion system, multiple skill trees, thankfully a loot drop overlay, a stash, also a place to store your things, waypoints, improved shops, multiple hub towns, socketable items and gems, and a face melting 800 by 600 resolution. Speaking of, let's switch over to Diablo 2 Resurrected, the 2021 remaster for the rest of this. Wait a second. There we go. One of the only things I found that hasn't aged too well in Diablo 2 is the stamina system that just kind of annoyingly limits how much you can sprint towards the start of the game, but later on it's pretty much not a thing. In the remaster, they changed it so that it regens while you're walking, which does help. And personally, I don't really care for charms. They take up inventory space to provide extra bonuses, so you're kind of accepting annoyance for statistical gain. I always just feel burdened by those things, maybe it's just me. However, Diablo 2 is still one of the greatest RPGs to this day, only mild pure nostalgia factored in, and I vividly remember the frenzy this caused when it came out. Every kid in my school with a janky home computer not designed for gaming was intensely trying to get this to run. Those who could were completely glued to it, to the point where grades were plummeting and parents were banning use of it in their homes. It was great! Twelve years after Diablo 2 dropped in 2012, we have Diablo 3, and the Reaper of Souls expansion two years later. D3 gave us the classes Barbarian, Crusader, Demon Hunter, Monk, Necromancer, Witch Doctor, and Wizard. Diablo 3's main focus seemed to be on raw action this time around, with huge piles of enemies, combo multipliers, environmental traps, and kind of like power-ups with the health and attack globes. A gory loot theme park is the best way I could quickly describe Diablo 3. The ways in which you can modify your gear in D3 are much deeper than before, which ties directly into your ability to level up the crafting vendors in town. Instead of skill trees this time around, skills and spells are unlocked over time as you level up, and each have different variations which alter how they function. The Reaper of Souls expansion luckily added a true endgame with its adventure mode, and honestly, I wasn't too hot on D3 until this came out. Adventure mode was addictive and rewarding, and really took advantage of the semi-randomized level generation, especially with rifts. Also, Paragon levels were introduced in D3, which allow you to further improve the stats of your build by pushing into harder and harder torment levels of difficulty. Going back into Diablo 3 for the first time in years, there's nothing that glaringly felt, ugh, this hasn't aged well, and it remains the big flashy loot piñata it's always been. Which takes us 11 years later into 2023 with Diablo 4. If everything stayed at the pace of Diablo 1 to Diablo 2, we would be at Diablo 9 by now. That's a little unrealistic though. The classes we have in 4 are the Barbarian, Rogue, Sorcerer, Necromancer, and Druid. Diablo 4's major difference this time around is injecting some MMO into its formula, and getting back to its RPG focus and tone from the first two games. While Diablo 3 felt hot topic dark, Diablo 4 seems to be getting back to its roots, being truly brooding, atmospheric, and serious this time around. Cue adorable puppy backpack. Unlike previous Diablo games, the overworld map in 4 is not generated randomly to allow for online players to scramble around in your game. When you head underground into a dungeon, those are instanced and maintain that semi-randomization like the previous games. That's kind of the best of both worlds. Half of the game world is solvable, I guess, with things being in predetermined areas you can purposely seek out, while the underground layer is classic, unpredictable dungeon crawling. Skill trees are back, and are quite a bit deeper than they were in Diablo 2, while also including some of Diablo 3's skill variation ideas. Aspects are another big change in Diablo 4, which are unlocked by completing certain dungeons or by extracting their effect off of legendary items. 
once you have an aspect modifier, which is essentially an effect usually exclusive to legendary gear. You can slap those onto gear of your choosing to have more direct control over your build. However, the main standout from my time with Diablo 4 is how much better boss fights have become. Check out the Butcher fight in Diablo 1. It's just a dude endlessly swinging at you over and over and over and over and over. In Diablo 4, boss fights are actually good boss fights with various phases, summons, and unique mechanics while having a greater focus on dodging attacks rather than just standing in front of them and smashing your DPS against theirs. The above ground overworld map also has giant world bosses out there. Just this early game one was more fun to try to kill than any other I fought in a more traditional MMO. Overall, Diablo 4 seems like a greatest hits of the Diablo franchise, but in the best ways. Bringing along the feel and tone of the older games and the deeper gear systems of the later entries while adding in just enough new to make it feel like its own thing. And with that, those were my thoughts on playing all four of the mainline Diablo games within the same month in 2023. Let me know what you think of Diablo 4, and also tell me which Diablo game was your very first. I started with Diablo 1, but hadn't played it since around when it launched until right now, so it was pretty much an entirely new game for me at this point. The main takeaways from all this, Diablo 1 is worth going back to and deserves a remake or a master before it gets forever lost to time. And Diablo 4 is fusing together the best elements from the first, second, and third game, maybe a bit from the telephone one. As always, this has been Alex, and thanks for watching.